Jesus, I pray today that we would feel your peace. Has everybody been served uh, communion or grabbed communion? If you guys are at home, uh, you can grab something. Lord knows, okay? I know we're living in some complicated times and I know there were certain methods and ways that we used to take communion, and now it seems awfully convenient with our little little cups and things that we kind of pull away. And sometimes, unfortunately, some of the modern conveniences that we have create a familiarity with this that it just becomes nothing more than just something we do. And it's got to mean more than that. It's got to. So in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus is meeting with his disciples, and um, there, are, there are moments that, that he is about to experience. He's had a conversation with his disciples, and, and you, guys, you guys can go and sit if you want to. I just want to take a minute here. I want to make sure that we have, we have a kind of a, space with God, with God for just a minute here, okay? Um, there's some people hurting today, and, and they need to be comforted by the truth of, of Christ's death and resurrection. But in Matthew 26, starting with verse 26, he says, While they were eating, Jesus took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. Now, in other conversations that he had had, likely study in the, um, in the Old Testament of Scripture, conversations at other places. We've seen this um, a lot more developed or teased out, if you will, but this is a very confusing and complicated statement that Jesus would actually say that they're ingesting his body. And I know it seems weird, but Jesus was saying that a part of who he is was becoming them. And Isaiah talks about how his uh, stripes or his beating, or the wounds, or the bruises that devastated his physical body was to bring us healing. And we lose sight of the value of this when we just assume that that healing is just a physical healing. There's a work, a process that Christ does within us because 
of his broken body because he decided, because he chose. The scripture tells us it was the joy set before him. That means that he was considering all of us, that he thought of every single one of us as he was considering the sacrifice that he would be making. That it would be such a hard, overwhelming moment. Many of us couldn't even begin to understand. And then he said, and then he took the cup and gave thanks and offered it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit, the vine, from now on until the day when I drink it anew with you in my father's kingdom. I cannot wait for the day. And I get to partake in communion with Christ. I can't. I can't. It's going to be so incredible. I, the implications of this statement of Christ should not be ever understated. Jesus is saying to them something that could never be acquired or attained. No matter how hard you try. In the Old Testament, they had sacrificial systems in an attempt to atone for Comfort and release people of the burden of sin, but for Jesus to say, your sins are forgiven. In fact, in one of the moments in the New Testament when Jesus is interacting with people and he heals someone, and he says, well, which is easier? As they're questioning him, which is easier, to tell someone that they're healed or that their sins are forgiven? And then it says in verse 30, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. That means that after this moment, they sung together. They celebrated together. So we're going to partake of these elements. And my prayer and hope is it's not familiar. And even if it is familiar, that we allow ourselves to hear the words of Christ again, that we connect closely to him and discover the freedom that he brings. And Lord Jesus as we partake of, of this bread, Lord, as we partake of this part of the elements of communion, I pray, God, that we would be awakened to the truth that you bring healing to our bodies, that you bring healing to us in emotions, physical, spirit, God, that you are the one who reconciles us to God, the one who erases our sin, the one who brings freedom. Let's partake of the, the bread. And Jesus, remind us constantly, <laughs> remind us constantly of the sacrifice that brings us freedom from our greatest flaws, from our sins, from the things that have corrupted us. Jesus, help us to know that when we partake of this cup, we are partaking in something that symbolizes the blood that was shed for us, that somebody had to die for how wretched we are that we could not save ourselves. So a perfect man had to do it so that we could be saved. A man who did not deserve to be punished for sin would take the sins of all of us upon his shoulders. Help us to live in that freedom. Let's partake of the cup. Jesus, I, I pray that we would have the courage, that you would help us to have the courage to fully embrace the freedom that we can have. Lord, that we would be released. And we would have hope today that we would be able to uncompromisingly hold to the truth that because of your death and resurrection, death is lost. And we no longer, no longer are held captive to that dark, evil enemy of fear and sin and death. And that the fatal blow to death itself has happened. 
And now we can walk in the newness of life. It's in your name we pray, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. So just a couple announcements for you, ladies. Please don't forget that if you are involved in the Wednesday night Bible study, we have two more of those. And if you are needed child care, remind me so that we do have adequate help um, on that evening if there are additional little friends. Yeah. Um, Pastor like has been helping with that, and he likes to plan little activities for our kids. So yeah, he's been having a good time. Okay, a couple announcements also tonight in concert over in Jefferson at 6 o'clock. Take your own lawn chairs on Route 115A at the ENR Dairy Farm. You can go see the Mark 209 group. So take your bug spray, take your lawn chairs, and go check them out. They were this was the group that was here in concert at Christmas. They are great, so you'll have a good time. Go and you know picnic it up, and it's a fun time. So make sure you go out. Um, do I have any other ones? Six o'clock. Did I say that? Six. And there's a poster on the backboard, and I'll set this one on the sound booth if you guys need to write down the address, okay? All right. Um, for those of you guys who are watching online, our giving link is in the description of the video. There's also other links that you guys can go to to get access to the different places that we're at, social media-wise, YouTube, et cetera, et cetera, um, so that you guys can go there. Also, uh, for those of you guys that are here this morning, there's a basket in the back of the sanctuary. Forgive my redundancy in telling you that every week. Um, I know you guys are familiar with that already. I just appreciate all of your faithfulness and your commitment to fulfilling God's commission to give so that we can uh, continue the ministries of this uh, of this church, so um, this morning I want to I want to celebrate a couple of things, and then I want to ask for prayer for those who mourn. Um, you know, we have these incredible, mighty moments in our life, and and they're just amazing. God does something, something so big, something so powerful, something so amazing that it just leaves us in shock. And we're like, okay. Um, case in point, I'll give you guys an example, a very clear example. Last week we were praying for Annette, and Annette's here this morning. Um, <laughs> I, I will tell you, I will tell you quite honestly and frankly, um, the night of what they were considering to be a stroke, I was with her in the ER talking. It was a very confused at times, Annette. She was able to talk. Um, or she was able to articulate some things, but she was having a hard time communicating and speaking, and there was a lot of concern. There was a lot of concern for Annette. That was not the case a week later when I sat in her hospital room and had a conversation with her. The nurses even told me, like, it's going to be a couple weeks before she can even think about going home. And then I went into the room, and Annette's like, well, they're actually saying maybe this weekend. Obviously, it was this weekend because she's here with us right now. But even talking to the nurses station um, on the floor that she was on, some of them had been with her the week prior, that Friday, and were now with her the, ne the, the following week, this, this la last week that passed. And they're just like, well, I don't get it. I don't understand. She's, di you know, it's like nothing was wrong, you know, in the first place. Um, you know, and, and in fact, sitting there with Annette and having a conversation with her uh, just earlier this week um, was just amazing, the joy and the excitement. And that is standing. I, you you want to, I don't know, where's that? You're fine. Okay. Well, yeah, but the people online can't hear you. I don't know where the mic is. But anyway, nice and, oh, Kelly's coming. Kelly's, Kelly's coming. We got we to gotta share stories. Okay. Help her hold it, babe. I want to praise God, thank God for everything, thank God for my pastor, my church, and my family. God healed me. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't. And I thank God for my pastor. He was with me through it all, and I was rough shape. I couldn't talk. I couldn't say boo. 
and I couldn't, my arms, I couldn't move them, my legs, I couldn't move them. But thank God, and I love my church and my church family, and I'll praise him every day. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And then, um, and then over here, you got Mr. Mike LeBounty. I don't know if you guys remember me having conversations with you about him, cancerous spots in his body, some the size of a, I don't know, like a silver dollar, a uh, quarter or more. And now he's going into, uh, into the hospital to have treatments done. And every time he walks in, the nurse or the people there are saying, there's our miracle, man. I remember when Mike told me what was happening, I, and I'm not sure how everybody feels about this, but I remember when Mike told me what was happening, I remember looking at him straight in the face and saying, okay, you took me hunting once, and it didn't happen, so you got to be around long enough for me to get my first deer. So, um, <laughs> so it's going to happen, okay, and then we're going to just say he's going to be around long enough to give me a lot more deer because i got a lot of mouths to feed, Right? <laughs> But that's a miracle. I mean, God is doing amazing things. Like, to be considered, to, to have conversations with medical professionals that say to themselves, it doesn't make sense, or it's a miracle, or it's uh, just confusing to me, um, biologically, what happened. It's just like, okay, wow, that's amazing. That's incredible. Now, I probably should have started with the, with the, the rough stuff and then got to the good stuff, but... Um, Sometimes loss touches us in such an incredibly close way that it's just, it's tough. And so, um, just suddenly this last week, Mike lost his brother, Tim, in such a sudden, in such a sudden way. Tim was good. He was um, working on a house, he was strong, he was vibrant, he was moving about like nothing was wrong, and then suddenly he wasn't with us anymore. There's a woman that I used to work with kind of close to us. My, daughter, my daughters went to school with, um, well, one of them still in school with her daughter, name's uh, Christine Hanna. Um, some of you guys might be familiar with that name. Her husband was on the road with somebody traveling um, south, and um, uh, Sam, Sam, Sam Borton, right? In the Sam Borton area, John H Hanna, the, the man driving the truck, flipped the truck, and John Hanna's gone. And so sometimes life provides for us such confusing moments. We see miracles in one moment and then tragedy in the next, and we try to make sense of it. And I'm not up here to be like, okay, here we go, Pastor. What are you going to give me that can help me with this? I got news. There's only one who can help you with this. I can give you some ideas and theories and talk to you and try to encourage you, but only Christ can comfort completely. How do I know that? Because I've grieved a lot in my life. So we're going to pray for people. We're going to pray for miracles. And I'm going to get into the word a little bit more. Jesus, we pray right now for people who are experiencing loss. We pray for people right now that are dealing with battles in their own body. Lord, I pray that they would be comforted. God, as you have comforted us, as we learned last week, as you have comforted us, that we would be put in places where we can comfort others. Those dealing with loss this morning, I pray, God, that they would be comforted by your grand mercy and grace and compassion. Be with them, Lord. And I pray also for miracles, more miracles. God, seeing someone this morning that was given a not-so-good <laughs> a not so good explanation from doctors about her condition, but she's here this morning celebrating because you healed her body. Amen. Lord, we know that. 
We, we could say that maybe the doctors were wrong in assessing this, but I was there, God. There was no wrong in their assessment. There was something that happened physically to her, and there is something that has been opposited, has changed. And we thank you, God, for the healing of Mike. God, I pray right now that just as much as he has been physically healed, I pray that you would come to him and comfort him in the loss of his brother. And God, I pray right now that as we reach out to you, God, that you would touch Christine's life, touch her, the lives of her children, bring them peace. Lord, we give you praise, God, even in the times that we don't understand. It's in your name we pray these things. Amen? Amen. 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 So I'm going to talk to you guys about a a guy by the name of Habakkuk, or Habakkuk, however you want to pronounce it. Last time I preached about this guy, I said it each way, like maybe 15 times throughout the sermon. But we're just going to go with Habakkuk, okay? Anyway, there's a statement that from his book... Um, in verse or chapter one, verse five, that we've often quoted um, this morning, I guess if you would title it, be utterly amazed. I'm doing something in your days that you would not believe even if it were even if you were told. OK, so if you look at this scripture really fast and uh, Habakkuk one five, it says the Lord replied. All right. Habakkuk's praying. We'll get to what he's praying about in just a minute. But the Lord replied, look around the nations and be amazed for I am doing something in your day, in your own day, something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. I saw this cross stitched on a pillow. OK, it's going to make sense in a minute. I saw this cross stitched on a pillow like this is a pretty cool statement like, oh, my goodness, we're going to be amazed. God's going to do something awesome and, and incredible. And, and it's just going to like change the way we see the world. It's going to change the way we see everything around us. It's just going to be awesome. And when we add the word nation there or nations, we're like, yes, revival. We're going to move back and God's going to do things that are amazing. I got OK, just so I get it out of the way. Um, we're America. We're not Israel. OK, we <laughs> there's a chosen people. OK, and we are grafted into that family tree. Absolutely. OK, but we can't look at this scripture. This is not about comparisons. This is not about parallels. We may see some comparisons and parallels to our wretchedness and their wretchedness. But this is not me saying that we and them are anyway. Let me get back to it. I think you guys know what I'm saying. So Habakkuk is having a hard time. He's having a really hard time. So unflinchingly, Habakkuk tells God exactly how he feels and what he's going through. Now, if you go back and read it into its entire context, as we've been talking about throughout this sermon series, this verse changed my life. I'm taking a little bit longer on this one than I normally do because there's so many verses that people have taken out of context. But we will see a larger explanation of what's going on. So Habakkuk says in verses, or chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, he says, How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence is everywhere. I cry out, but you do not come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I am surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. People who love to argue and fight. All right. Mm. Some of that kind of hits close to home. Anyway, the law has become paralyzed and there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous so that justice has become perverted. He's upset. Habakkuk's like, this is not okay. God, there's all these problems. There's these issues. There, you know, I'm offended. What are you doing? Why aren't you responding? Do you not listen? That's like kind of like, whoa. You know, like how do, we, how do we say that to God? Like, whoa, hey, you know, like Habakkuk, chill out, man. You know, like how can you question? Come on, you guys have been there before. Like what's going on, God? Um, can I have you know, like an idea here. Can you explain to me what's happening? And this is where God, this is where God responds with verse five. And and if I could preface it with this, but sometimes we don't get the answer we really want. How many of you guys have, have been through that before? 
Like, like you're like, God, help me. God, come through. God, do something amazing. God, just get involved. Answer my prayers. And then God answers. You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's not what I was expecting, God. I, I mean, I thought we had a, an agreement here. You know, wait, 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 wait. We get angry and frustrated and we start telling God what we need him to do. And then God's like, all right, let's go. <laughs> you know, and that's what happens here. The answer isn't kind. So he says this, all right, um, Habakkuk 1, starting with verse 5, just to reiterate what we already read. The Lord replied, look around the nations, look and be amazed, for I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe, even if someone told you about it. Woohoo! yes, 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 yes. Verse 6, I am raising up the Babylonians, or the Chaldeans, a cruel and violent people. They will march across the world and conquer other lands. They are notorious for their cruelty and do whatever they like. Their horses are swifter than chariots or leopards and fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their charioteers charge from far away like eagles. They swoop down and devour their prey. On, on, on they come... All bent on violence, their hordes advance like a desert wind sweeping captives ahead of them like sand. They scoff at kings and princes and scorn all their fortresses. They simply pile ramps of earth against their walls and capture them. They sweep past like the wind and are gone, but they are deeply guilty for their own strength is their own God. That's kind of a, that's kind of like a connection to what's coming for them. But before I even go any farther, I need to make a statement. Corrupt kingdoms may be a part of the plan, but God, but that doesn't mean God has endorsed them. We need to understand that right away. Okay, they may be a part of the plan. Okay, news. God's plan is going to win. God's plan is going to see. God is going to do what God does. Our decisions determine what side of that plan we land on. Like, God's going to do what God's going to do. There is no avoiding that, but our choices determine where we land in that plan. And so this is going to happen. Habakkuk's like, I'm not okay with this. And God's like, okay, I'm not okay either. And the Chaldeans or the Babylonians, they're coming, and they're going to mess things up. They're going to pull your people into exile. And then so, like, Habakkuk comes back. We'll get to some important points in a minute here. But Habakkuk comes back in, in uh, a second complaint. He says, oh, Lord, my holy one, my holy one. He's a little bit nicer now. Um, you who are eternal, surely do not plan to wipe us out. Like, before he's like, God, where are you? Why aren't you listening? What's going on? And then he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. One who is eternal, holy one. You know, oh, Lord, our rock, you have sent these Babylonians to correct us, to punish us for our many sins. But you are pure and cannot stand the sight of evil. Will you wink at their treachery? Should you be silent while the wicked swallow up people more righteous than they? Essentially, what he's getting at is we're pretty rotten, but they're worse. Okay, like we're we're wretched, but they are more wretched. Okay. Um, verse 14, are they, um, or I'm sorry, are we only fish to be caught and killed? Are we only sea creatures that have no leader? Must we be strung up on their hooks and caught in their nets while they rejoice and celebrate? Then they worship their nets and burn incense in front of them. These nets are the gods who have made us rich with are rich, they claim. Will you let them get away with this forever? Will they succeed forever in their heartless conquests? All right. He's having a hard time. He's having a hard time. He's confused. He's frustrated. He's overwhelmed. He doesn't understand what's going on. Now, Habakkuk's a different kind of prophet book okay it's a different kind of story because in the other books of the prophets they're giving a message to the people they're like having conversations with the people and they're like this is what god says this is what god is doing this is what god means this is what's going to happen etc etc in the book of habakkuk it records a conversation that a prophet is having with god it's just the two of them in a dialogue 
It's just a conversation about how Habakkuk's having a hard time and doesn't understand what is going on, is very confused and frustrated and overwhelmed. He sees that their own nation is a mess, that they're making bad decisions, and they're doing morally corrupt things. But then he looks, then he looks at the, Chalde- the Chaldeans or, or, um, or the Babylonians, and he's like, yo, they're worse. They're worse, you know? He's like mad because there's violence and injustice. The law has been neglected. The current leadership is corrupt. But then he's like, wait a minute. Hold on. What do you mean? What do you mean that these people are going to rise up and they're going to harm us? They're oppressive and there's injustice. They, they're, they're unjust in economics. They, they're irresponsible leaders. They make slaves. They're full of idolatry. This is bad, God. This is bad. Sometimes it is very, very hard to understand what God is doing. It's like a round two to this complaint. Maybe um, Habakkuk is, is coming to God with a little more compassion and kindness, but, but there's such confusion about God's plan. He doesn't understand. He doesn't get it. He doesn't know why God is allowing this to happen. He doesn't have a full and complete understanding of God's plan. Let me get to a couple points. Um, And I'm seeing now how challenging this might be to accept, but um, sometimes God does things that we don't like. We want it to go a certain way, and God's like, no, we're going to do it this way. And it's hard. We're like, God, this is unfair. This is unjust. These people are this, and we need to deal with this. God, our, our people, Israel, you know, whatever, is so busted and messed up. They're doing things they shouldn't do. They're unjust. They're corrupt. They're unrighteous, and God's like, okay, I got a, I got a, um, a solution for that. We're going to break them. And it can be very hard. Let me make just a couple points this morning. Number one, you will miss knowing who God really is when you only focus on what you think he isn't. Habakkuk's like a mess. Uh, he, he gets to a better point later on in the book, but he's a mess. He's like, God, why aren't you? Who are you? Are you going to wink at what they do? Like, what is the deal here, God? You're just going to allow this to happen? You're going to just allow this to take place. And in that moment, Habakkuk is totally confusing the nature of who God is. He has no full or thorough idea of who God really is. God is about to reveal to him who he really is. He's going to do some difficult things that are going to lead towards repentance. It's going to be hard. But if we we begin to look at God and say, well, you're not doing this, you're not doing this, you're not doing this, and wait, you're, who are you, God? When we begin to look at everything that we believe God isn't, we are going to completely miss who he really is. And some of you guys have experienced that in your own life. You're frustrated. You're angry. He's not coming through. Things aren't going the way you wanted them to. And you're like, okay, God, who are you? And why are you doing this? And we're so focused on what he is or isn't doing that we miss completely who he is and what he is doing. Who he is and what he is doing. My my second thought here is, is you can ask someone what they're doing without questioning who they are. Okay, so like when I tell you, like when when Habakkuk went to God and said, what's the problem? Why are you doing this? Like he has two criticism. He has two uh, issues. He has two problems that he brings up. He's frustrated. He's like, "Okay, God, (laughs) here's my here's my first complaint and here's my second complaint. Okay, now he's having an issue with understanding who God is, but we need to realize today that there are moments in our life that it's okay to question what he's doing, but we don't have to question who he is. We don't have to. Appropriate questions about someone, appropriate questions about God are not always 
questioning their character. They're not always questioning who they are. So when you find yourself in a difficult place and you're like, okay, God, who are you? What are you doing? What's going on? Make sure that you recollect his character. Make sure that you tally up the things that he's done in the past. Make sure you listen and you are very, very connected to, very connected to who he really is because you cannot possibly Look at and interpret the things that he is doing if you are completely confusing who he is. He is not vindictive, all right? He is not standing up there waiting to just knock us down every mistake that we make. However, we need to realize that God is purely, completely, and totally loving, but he is also just. He is completely and totally forgiving and compassionate and merciful, but indeed he practices wrath. That is not convenient. Now, if you look at the entire story of Habakkuk, you will hear or discover that God comes through, that though a nation that is morally corrupt and broken are used to break the backs of the Israelites, they get theirs. God's like, He's not like, okay, just back up and let them do their own thing and, and, and whatever. No, the, the Babylonians or the, the Chaldeans, they get judged by God later on. I don't have time to unpack the whole story, but you guys, it's, it's a short book. It's three chapters. Jump in it and read it. It's, it's beautiful and confusing. It's frustrating and amazing. All of those things, okay? So, uh, point number three. Often, it is in the moments that are hardest to trust God that become the most important ones it's obvious it's like duh but seriously it's the moments that are the hardest oh I don't understand God I'm so angry God I'm so confused I'm so frustrated I don't get it it's in those moments that we need to dig deep it's in those moments that we need to trust who God is it's in those moments that we need to hold tightly to him in Habakkuk 2 3 and 4 this is in the second chapter he's moving on in his conversation he's talking about his complaints and and this is what he comes to discover the vision for the future time it described the end and it will be fulfilled if it seems slow at coming wait patiently for it will surely take place it will not be delayed I don't like the word patiently (laughs) neither do you but that's exactly What we need to do. And in verse 4 it says, look at the proud. They trust in themselves. And their lives are crooked. But the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. The righteous will live by faith. This is referenced by Paul in Romans. I'm going to read to you the Passion Translation to give a little bit more of a, uh, a personal connection here. This gospel unveils, this is Romans 1.17, this gospel unveils a continual revelation of God's righteousness, a perfect righteousness given to us when we believe. And it moves us from receiving life through faith to the power of living by faith. This is what the scripture means when it says we are right with God through life-giving faith. Literally translated, Romans 1.17 tells us that we move from an impotent faith into an explosive faith of the gospel of Christ. The righteous live by faith. Those who are in right standing with God, those who are connected to God, those who are personally and intimately and, and, and thoroughly in faith, in righteousness, connected to God, have this explosive faith that is founded in the gospel of Christ. Okay, pastor, what the heck are you saying right now? What are you telling me? What, what, what are you speaking to me? Let me, let me kind of state this phrase, okay, because I, I want to make sure it connects. It's hard to trust God when life doesn't make sense and perhaps even harder when he doesn't, when he doesn't make sense. But we truly discover what righteous faith is when we allow our trust in him to lead us to complete surrender. Let me read that again. It's hard to trust God when life doesn't make sense. I'm just going to pause there for a minute. It's hard to trust God when life doesn't make sense. 
Am I wrong? No, not at all. I don't like that diagnosis, all right? I don't like that my bank account is bottoming out. I don't like that, uh, you know, the, like these things are happening. I'm, I'm not saying I, I'm just saying in general. You know, like, I'm confused, God. Like, what's happening out there? You know, like, you turn on the social media feeds, you turn on the news, you turn on what's going on, you're like, okay, you know, like, what, what is it? You know, like the wild, wild west in the politics here? Like, what's going on? <laughs> like, what is happening here? Why are we such a decadent and evil place? And it's not just here, it's everywhere. Like, what is the problem? What is the problem? Why is everything so messed up and so confused? And we're just like, okay, God, this doesn't make sense. My situation doesn't make sense. Life itself doesn't make sense. And that's hard enough, but then when God himself doesn't make sense? Now, let's be real. The Bible tells us that his ways are above our ways, beyond our ways. He has a better understanding and comprehension than we could even begin to believe. His knowledge of things is so much grander than anything. He knows you better than you know you. And some of us, we don't know ourselves very well. Like, we, we, we say, oh, that young person, they're just trying to find themselves, and they're trying to just discover who they are. I got news for you. You're going to be trying to find yourself to the day you die because that's just, that's the struggle. But when we begin to connect to God, when we begin to connect to the Savior, he will begin to define to us and help us. But it is really hard when God himself says something, when God himself does something, when God himself makes something happen or allows something or changes the script or changes the story, and we're like, wait a minute, I'm having a hard enough time understanding life. Now I'm having a hard time understanding you, God. Like, isn't this supposed to be easy? Isn't this supposed to be convenient? Isn't this supposed to be like this wonderful, you know, like amazing process? And then God does something and throws a kink in the whole thing. And you're like, what is happening? So it's even harder sometimes when he doesn't make sense. But we truly discover righteous life. We truly discover that explosive life that we have in the gospel of Christ. We truly discover what it means to live life, what it means to be righteous, what it means to follow God when we allow ourselves to trust in him in a way that leads us completely to surrender. How many micromanagers do we have in the house? Right? Yes, we are all just a little bit controlling. Right? Because, because why? Because we think that if we, who said a little bit? A little bit, nothing. Anyway, all right. We just believe all right, don't, don't look at me like that. We are micromanagers creating other micromanagers, okay? That's just how it works. <laughs> All right, anyway. So, because why? We believe that if we can hold it together, then it's going to be held together. We believe that we can fix it all. Like, okay, God, if I am able to do this, and if I can handle this, and if I can explain this, and I can control this, and I can do this, then everything will work out. doesn't work that way. doesn't work that way. We need to surrender. Habakkuk's having a hard time. He's like, God, this is a mess. Oh, God, you're about to make a bigger mess. I don't understand. And in that moment, Habakkuk's got to step back and let God do his thing. He's got to let God take control. He's got to allow God to accomplish his will. And see, at the end of the story... Habakkuk finds himself in a place of worship. He finds himself in a place completely and totally connected to God. I thought I had put this in the, uh, the notes there. I'm sorry. Um, but he finds himself completely and personally engaged in the creator of the universe. And if you go to, Hebrew, or if you go to, um, if you go to Habakkuk chapter 3, you will indeed discover what it means... Hmm, Man, this is so good. What it means when you trust God completely, when you rely on him totally in every single sense of the word, something big happens. 
back is having a hard time. And in chapter 3, verse 1, it says, this prayer was sung by the prophet Habakkuk. It was so beautiful that he was able to sing. And he says this in, in, in verse 2. It says, I have heard all about you, Lord. I am filled with awe by your amazing works. In this time of our deep need, help us again as you did in the years gone by. And in your anger, remember your mercy. Now, there's all kinds of other things that happen here. I mean, he talks about nations. He talks about the brilliance of the sunrise. He talks about God's wrath. He talks about God's power. He talks about what God is going to do. He's, t he's talking about, like, all these amazing and brilliant and powerful and mighty, even wrathful things of God. But then he gets to the end there, and he says something very hard, starting in verse 17. This, this is actually a song, too. Some of us might have heard it. But it says that, well, I mean, it's a song because he, he's singing a song, but some people have um, produced and sung this song as of recent. He says, even though the fig trees have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though olive crops, olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty. That is a very, very grim expression. Led in song. He says this, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. Essentially, he's talking about a deer that's in the mountaintops. He's talking about a deer that's sure-footed, a deer that's not going to fall, a deer that's strong and stable enough to stand on cliffs. That's what he's talking about. He's like, look, <laughs> the cherry blossoms, man. They, it, everything's dead. The vines are dead. The olive crops are failing. There's nothing in the barns, God. But yet, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. That is what God wants us to do. Okay, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Because why? I will be joyful in God my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. You're fatigued. I'm fatigued. You're frustrated. I'm frustrated. Things aren't going your way. Things aren't going my way. What do I do? I begin to trust God because he's the one that makes me sure-footed. We need to say in this, man, we get up and we're like, oh, I hate this. Oh, I'm frustrated about this. Oh, this is overwhelming. Oh, this makes me mad. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. What? Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. Living by faith means trusting in God's promises, even when we don't understand them. This is relying on God's strength, not our own. It means believing that God will work all things out. He'll work it together for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. It means living life of obedience to God even when it's not easy and even when it doesn't make sense. Guys, I'm telling you, follow him. Follow his plan. Follow his way. Be connected to him. And when you lose jobs, when you lose loved ones, this is not easy. When you get diagnoses, when your bank is emptied and everything is falling apart, you can say, yes, I will rejoice in the Lord because he is my strength. He is my salvation. I will be joyful. There is no other way in explaining joy and freedom and peace and comfort. And, and there's, there's no explanation for it other than trusting God. It, it, is, it, is it connecting? Is it, is it connecting? Okay. Okay, good. 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 And so let me ask you some questions. We'll close here. Let me ask you some questions. What are you facing that doesn't make sense? What are you facing that doesn't make sense? <laughs> yep, <laughs> word. <laughs> what are you facing that doesn't make sense? Uh, this is not easy. This is not convenient. I'm not telling you I have the answers, but I'm telling you I know the one who does. And even when he doesn't answer you, even when you don't understand who he is or what he's doing, you can trust him. Why? 
Man, I've found myself in some monumental messes, and God in his love and his compassion have brought me through them all. So what are you facing that doesn't make sense? How will you trust God more when he doesn't make sense? Is God not going to make sense at times? Yes. Why? Because you are a human being, and you can't possibly begin to understand the one who put the universe in its place. I don't know about you, but I would not. I mean, I'm thankful that he's got it figured out, but can you imagine all the prayers, all the tears, all the complications, everything in the, that's happening in the world, in the universe, all of it happening, all of it coming to you all at once, and he's able to, to listen to it all? What? You're not going to get it. I'm not going to get it. But we can trust him. Yeah, we can trust him. Habakkuk had to trust God when an enemy nation was coming in to hurt them and exile them. He had to trust God in that moment. I think, I think we can handle trusting God when the, the bank is accounts a little low or under low. Man, some of us have learned how to squash things out of pennies. Ne nobody ever thought possible. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but... How will we trust God more when he doesn't make sense? And, and last, what are you going to do with what was just learned? There's a whole lot of this going on right now. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of emptiness. There's a lot of brokenness. There's a lot of people wondering, like, why? And God's right there to meet them. God wants to explain some things today. He wants to help you. I'm going to shut up so he can begin speaking, but please surrender to his work. And even when you don't understand him, even when you're confused and overwhelmed, listen to his voice tell you in the end of it all, I'm going to take care of it. In the end of it all, it may, it may not be easy in the moment, but I'm working on something that you can't even begin to understand. God, help us to rely on you. Jesus, we thank you for the freedom that you bring us. And I pray, Lord, right now that we would completely and totally surrender to who you are, God, that we would discover oh, the freedom that you and you alone bring. God, when it doesn't make sense and when you don't make sense, help us in our frailty and our confusion to trust you. Help us to be like Habakkuk, that at the beginning of whatever moment we're in, we're overwhelmed, but at the end we're saying, God, whatever may be, whatever may come, yet I will rejoice because my faith is in you and I am secure. Lord, I feel so much pain and sadness, not just here, but in people everywhere. God, help us to grab this truth and take it to others. Bring people freedom today. in your name we pray these things, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. If you guys need some prayer, come see me. I'd love to pray with you guys. Be richly blessed.